I'm having my usual fabulous, wonderful, entertaining, stunning chat with choreographer William Solo. And uh, th this guy's New York based, but as I asked him just a couple of minutes ago, you know, he, he really needs, if he can afford to, to uh, at, at least rent a you know, year round apartment in Santa Barbara, because this man has become an institution, may I say that, in Santa Barbara over the past. 15 anyway years, 15 years yes. something, something like that. Yeah. We have seen, Santa, I mean Santa Barbara has, and we're talking about Bill, William Solo who is choreographing the upcoming uh, April 5th Saturday evening at the Granada Theater production of his own full length ballet, Carmen. We'll talk about that in a minute, but I mean that should should have sent off explosions in everybody's head. Carmen, remember that story? That's the story. That's the one that draws everybody. It's a fabulous, fabulous story, and we'll talk about it. Very complex, uh, but other stuff here in Santa Barbara. Let's just uh, mention a couple. An American Tango. I predict the biggest, most gigantic success in the history of State Street Ballet. That show. And uh, William, is all, William Solo is also uh, famous for, no, hang on, let's stop all the famous stuff, yeah. but, but, but what he's got going. We've done, we've done Carmina Burana, yeah. Appalachian Spring, yep. Firebird, yep. Um, Starry Night, um, quite a few. Yep, and what I was going to say is not that he was famous for bringing all those things here to Santa Barbara and, and, and setting all of them on State Street Ballet, yeah, over mm -hmm. the years. Uh, but, but that he's very famous for tinkering. And what he tinkers with is he insists sometimes, I don't think in Carmen, right? But bringing in some... Uh, some uh, um, I thought about it, though, Dan. Bring in a narrator. No, I'm not. Don't have a narrator in Carmen. <laughs> okay. There's no narrative in Carmen. Doesn't need to be. But the point is, uh, this, this guy is coming from theater. I think I can say that. And, and uh, Tango and others are... Uh, Multi, multiple delights for audiences. Carmen doesn't doesn't need to have any special tricks or narrative. It is uh, huge. Let's talk about it for just a second. I understand because I have read the wonderful interview that Mary Love Thralls uh, did with you recently uh, that you are taking the Carmen story, which I think you know people who do not know the Carmen story, if I may say so, you're probably not watching this <laughs> channel. In other words, this is the knockdown drag out. Trist, uh, love affair, murder, violence, jealousy, all that story. I'm going to let Bill tell us this yeah, well, story. It is one, as you know, it's one of probably um, one of the top three operas of all time that's done all over the world. And, and uh, um, the story is so powerful, but it's not just the story, it's the music that Bizet wrote for it when it first, uh, when it first opened in 1875. Um, of course, um, the story of Carmen caused quite a uh, controversy because, first of all, um, it was about proletarian life. It was about gypsies and Basque, you know, people who were looked down upon at that time in, in mid-century, 19th century Europe. And can we just it, call it? Can we just call it racism? Okay, no, racism, racism. And, it, and you know, the lead character gets murdered at the end. Um, and everybody dies. I mean, it's a sad, it's a sad thing. So it caused quite a stir because it was it was um, um, opera comique, which was um, uh, at the time uh, you would have dialogue between yeah. the the singing, and it was pretty tame back in 1875. It was family oriented, and this opera was not a family oriented. It was dealing with sex, with treachery with um, um, sins and allurement and all these things. <laughs> it wasn't your normal opera at the time. Um, but it was sort of a bridge between that and the Verissimo, which was the realism of Italian opera. And it kind of bridged that gap. And it really, it really changed opera f from then on. Um, it, it, um, it, it was not really successful um, uh, when it first premiered. Actually, it was in Paris. It was actually never done again for seven years. That's because people had to go like this for about seven years just to get over it. <laughs> they did. and uh, It ran for uh, 36 performances, but Bizet, uh, Bizet died after yeah. 32. At the 32nd performance, he passed away. So he never got to see the critical success that Carmen eventually had. But he um, it had productions in London and had productions in Italy, I believe, and they were big, big successes. So when it came back, I believe in 18, uh, about seven years later, 
1882, I believe, um, it then got the appreciation uh, that it deserved, and the French audiences responded to it, and from then on, it's been, been a staple in, their, in the reps of every opera company in the world since then. Now let's talk about turning it into a dance and how you have conceived, and apparently you've changed it a bit from the original uh, production in 2006 that you conceived. And by the way, you know, in opera, it's like here's this, and then there's that, and then there's that, and then there's that, and then there's the end, whereas you have, as I mentioned earlier, kind of flipped things around a bit more cinematically. Well, let me go back. The, the, the first Carmen ballet, as a ballet, was Maya Plitskaya in, uh, uh, in uh, 1964. She was the, a principal at the Bolshoi Ballet, and she wanted to do a version of Carmen um, with original music, and she wanted to use the story, um, which is from Prosper Mermaid, Mermaid book um, of 1845, and, but she wanted to do an original version of Carmen and she, for dance, and she first... Um, uh, uh, asked Shostakovich if he would um, wow. compose a score. He was terrified. He said, how can you compete with Bizet? Bizet is so well known. Those melodies are so well known. You know, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Um, Fool. She, then, she then asked um, Kachadorian, who had just finished his Spartacus, I believe, or whatever, yeah. and he too said, listen, you know how can you how can you compete with with such well known melodies? It, you will be sure to disappoint. If I wrote any type of music for Carmen that's not those melodies, forget it. He said, "Listen, your husband's a composer. You have let him let him um, compose it." So, Shedrin, um, uh, 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 who was the husband to Plitskaya, was a little nervous about it, but. Um, when she saw the uh, uh, National Ballet of uh, Canada come to um, Russia in 1966, Alonzo was the uh, 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 choreographer, and she went up to him and said, listen, I, I'm interested in doing this ballet called Carmen, and asked him if he would choreograph it. And they didn't have music yet, but Shedrin had said he was going to write the music for her. Um, Alonzo goes back to Canada, sets it on the uh, back to Cuba, sets it on the Cuban ballet. They teach it to the Bolshoi, and only then, when she, he saw the steps, did he start the process of creating a, a score for Carmen. And what he did, he realized, as Shostakovich had told him, because they were actually friends, um, he realized that he could not compete with those melodies of 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 uh, Bizet. They were, people knew the story too well. They knew those melodies. And so what he decided to do was he was going to be, um, uh, in his own words, a collaborator with Bizet. He was going to take Bizet's melodies and, you, and do different things with them and intersperse them into his arrangement of that. And in doing so, he totally changed the orchestration and the orchestra. He got rid of the percussion um, I mean, it got rid of the trumpets and the, you know, the horns and whatever, and he totally created it just for strings and percussion, with a big, big percussion, you know, uh, hmm. size in the orchestra, and so it has a very modern sensibility to it, and and it's very earthy and heavier, but it still has all those melodies um, from the, from the original opera, but sometimes he twists them a little bit different, and the notes might not be the same, but um, in doing so, he would he allowed he allowed to keep the Bizet music, which everybody knew, but he gave his own interpretation of it. So he didn't he wasn't really considered an arranger of the music. He was an equal partner in this new version for dance, which made it more danceable also. Um, and the original um, Carmen, which I did in two thousand and five, was the Carmen Suite, which was Shedrin's score for the ballet, and I think it's about forty five minutes long. And that's the version that I did. And it was a big success at that point in 2005 for State Street Ballet. But Rodney asked me if I could create a full-length ballet, Carmen. So what I did, 
I, I wanted to keep Bizet music, um, obviously. I wanted to keep it all Bizet. So I took from two other operas of his, The Pearl Fishers um, and Larizian, uh, The Girl from Arl, that uh, opera. I took such their instrumental music from those um, two other operas and, and put it in, like I do, with my sound effects, yes. as you know, yep. with bugles and you know da 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 da, da and all that stuff, um, and created a full length yeah. um, out of it. So now it's a full length ballet in two acts, um, and that twist we were talking about in, in in Carmen that I used the same vehicle in Starry Night. I start the ballet at the end, so the first scene you see. Is actually the end of the ballet. She's dead, kaput, or she gets dead and kaputted. Yeah, Carmen's not in the last scene of the ballet. Oh, sorry. I thought she's her body is laying on there on the. Sorry. See what an idiot I am. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no. I, I don't want to give it away, but it's, oh. it, it deals with Don Jose. He's the first person you see at the end of the ballet. Okay. okay. Now, Carmen has already gone by. Now, he is about to be shot. Really? Now, see, uh, the, in, the, in the opera, I don't remember this. I remember him just falling at her body, and, you know, the whole last scene is him in collapse, that he's done this horrible thing, et cetera, et cetera. So, well, the original me, story of Carmen, remember, Carmen's done many yeah. different ways. In the original yeah. story of Carmen, um, sh sh in, the, in, the, in the book, Carmen is, I mean, Carmen has died, has committed murder, um, and, and actually, it, it's interesting because Don Jose blames it on Carmen and said it was because of her, the way she was, that's why she died. He took no responsibility for it. The opera, you see the, you see the depths of despair he goes into. But in, that, in, the, in the book, in what, he, he dies. He is shot. For every, his crime. For his crime of murder. Everybody has done different versions. Hmm. Well, mine starts in front of a firing squad. Nice. Okay? So, so it becomes a flashback. Mm. The whole story is now told from that flashback. Wow. So that's how I started. But anyway, I don't want to give too much away, Dan. You're, you know, you ask me too many questions, and, this, and, and it's a... Uh, um, but Carmen, I've kind of... Uh, you, know, you know I like to shift things, yeah. and I like to take them outside the box a little bit. I still have it in Seville in 1820, 1830. Mm -hmm. I still have it set in that time period in the costumes and such, but um, when, when the, in the book, you really had the two main characters. You had Don Jose and Carmen, and you have a Toreador, but he's not really a main character. In the opera, they wanted to develop the character of Carmen and Don Jose, so they added other characters, like Michaela, who is the country girlfriend of Don Jose, and they added Escamillo who is the counterpoint to Don Jose in, a, in attentions for um, her love. Um, and they were used as a vehicle to, to broaden the, the depth of their portrayal uh, in the opera. Um, and in my ballet, I, those four characters are the main characters. There is a, the captain of the guards, Uzunga, who does play a, little, a role in my ballet, but it's really the four, four characters um, who are the most important. Um, uh, but in my ballet, um, everybody says, "Oh, Carmen's this free spirit. She, nobody can possess her." And and I was going to get to that, but go ahead. Let's hear oh, your okay. story. Well, you can ask me a question, but I wanted to make uh, you know how I because I'm coming from acting, uh, uh, and I, I approach my my works as a, a theater as well as dance, and I have the dancers. It's very important that they understand the dramatic intent of the action of the story. And so um, uh, I wanted to make this a more um, a Carmen that you actually feel sorry for at the end. And you feel sorry for Don Jose at the end, for both of them, not just Don Jose. And this mm -hmm. woman who doesn't care, you know, blah, 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 blah. Good. So wanted, far, you're OK with me. Go ahead. I wanted there to be empathy. Yeah. Because though she might be hiding those feelings that she has, showing that inner soft side to her, she never shows it. She's always, she's always brash and putting up that facade and nobody can possess her. And, 
and, and, and she uses her wiles and her sexiness and all that stuff to get what she wants. She's always been that way. She, 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 she chooses her lovers. She chooses her lovers. She's, she's powerful. She's powerful. But in my version, I, I want also there to be moments where the audience sees that Carmen's kind of realizing that she doesn't have the type of love that she's seeing others have. But she doesn't want to admit that in my version. So it makes her softer. Um, and so it get, you have empathy for both of them at the end. In, in most versions of Carmen, Carmen knows she's going to die. She, you know, she's already gone through the fortune cards and all that stuff. And she's, she knows she's going to die, whatever. My version, she has no idea that Don Jose is going to get so enraged and stab her in my version. And so it creates a much more, to me, powerful moment. Yeah. Um, so it's probably a softer Carmen. Uh, not so much the thief, the, you know, wantonous woman. I mean, somebody who gets her way with men, no doubt about but it. But that's a big defensive thing anyway. So, I mean, you, so you're exactly. saying she's a, a sensitive, uh, well, I'll ask the question in a sec, but go ahead, yeah. I mean, am yeah, I no, close? That, so that's how I approach it. It's a much more realistic version of events. Uh, I mean, of people, yeah. so it has more honesty. So they they really become characters that you can empathize with. Fair enough. Now I have to do this, or Rodney Gustafson will have my head. Which is, we forgot from the very beginning to, to do the whole plug. Which is uh, William Solo, choreographer. The uh, production coming up is Carmen. You've just heard plenty. I mean, plenty more than I was expecting to hear. In other words, this is a juicy one. We already knew it was juicy. Uh, production of Carmen, as realized by choreographer William Solo, music of Bizet and uh, Chadrin, uh, 20th century and 19th century, uh, take on this wonderful music, and we're talking a performance by State Street Ballet, the one and only, the last performance of the season, one performance only, Carmen, on Saturday evening, April 5th, that's coming up in a couple weeks, 7.30 p.m., Granada Theater, one last bit, Phone number for all of you. You know, you tell, get, go and you dial the thing. It's called area code 805. That's for Santa Barbara. 899-2222. That is the Granada Theater box office. And by the way, you, you guys in Southern California, if you haven't ever been up to uh, Santa Barbara to see the Granada, you know, it's pretty. it's been made rather a splendid place these days. We can kind of sort of call it an opera house, you know. Uh, so there you go. April 5th, Saturday evening, 7.30, Granada Theater in Santa Barbara, this one and only performance of Carmen. Now let, let's let's get back to a couple of questions here. We, we've, uh, you, you have given me a beautiful storyline. Is there any more that you'd like to speak to about that just now? And then I'll throw well, a couple of questions. Unfortunately, we're only doing one performance of this. So if, it's not like somebody can say, oh, I saw this performance, I'll come back tomorrow. It's only once. So the audience should realize that we're not doing this several times. It's just going to be for one performance. See uh, how involved he is with State Street Ballet? Uh, well, even, even William Solo is plugging this gig. Okay. Well, no, well <laughs> this is like, I'm like the resident choreographer here. So, yeah, but it, I feel like it's, it's, it, the company has been such a part of me for 15 years. Yeah. Um, and Libero, which I hear has been re redone, is a, was a small Granada. theater. And so here at the Granada, uh, I can spread it out more. Oh, I see what you mean. And, and um, uh, it, because in my ballet, I decided that I wanted the whole thing to take place, as did the original Carmen ballet, um, in a, in a, like in a center of a bull ring. Mm. So I have ramps that come onto the stage from all around. It's a great, it's great to have ramps come down, but they take up dance space. Hmm. And so at the Libero, it's a little bit tight. But at the Granada, I'll have enough room hmm. for all, for the extra dancers that we have in the production. Um, so uh, it will be a lot easier for the dancers, so they won't have to crowd themselves. On Let, them. Let's run through, Bill, for me the three principles. Okay, we have. Uh, well, I have one right here. But oh, that's right. Yeah. Hey, Lila, get in here. <laughs> this is my hey, Carmen. She's been sitting there so quietly. I forgot all about you. There she is, Lila Drake. Hi, Li Ann. Who will be playing Carmen. What? What? Don't slide away. Stay, stay, stay in there. Now, get yeah. in tight. Oh, I, I hate yeah. to say this, but you got to get in tight. Get in tight. Yeah, we're here. Tighter. We're here. Okay, we go. Have, we have Lila, who plays Carmen. Yeah. We have Ryan. Um, Camus. Camus, who plays Don Jose. We have Randy Herrera. 
who was my Dutch Schultz in uh, American Tango. He's back and he's doing uh, Escamillo. And then we have Michaela, played by Cecily Stewart. And the four of them are the main characters in this in this uh, production. And did Lila, Lila, did you do the 2006-7 performance? I can't remember. Um, I've done every version of this show. So in other words, this so is Carmen, necessarily. She, but. I started um, at the bottom and worked my way up. But yeah, in 2007, I did the role of Carmen. Aha, uh -huh, nice. You know, the beauty of this company, and let's just talk about it for a little bit, State Street Ballet, it's a resident professional company in Santa Barbara. Uh, now we've got practically a resident choreographer from New York City, no less, uh, who, per, who enjoys coming out here. Um, what, what's this? What is? The, can you speak just for a couple minutes? This ambiance, this wonderfulness. What is it? Is it Gustafson? Is it? Can, give well, me something. It's all those things, but it's 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 the dancers. I, honestly, it's, it's it's the dancers, and I have, as I've told you before, I've known these dancers. I've known Lila for since she was in. Got, get, got out of college here, right here in Santa Barbara. I've known her, I've seen her grow from being in the back row. Um, I know a lot of these dancers. And Marina, who's the ballet master here, was in my first Ballet Starry Night back in 1998. Um, uh, and she's a ballet master here. So I've seen these people. So for me, when I come in, Dan, as a choreographer, um, it's great because I can come in and I know what the situation is. I know all the policy, politics, all that stuff, I can throw that right off over my shoulder and just get right to work. I don't have to deal with it. I can come in the first day and just bang, go right at it. Because I know the dancers so well. And, and of course, my relationship with Rodney is great. And Rodney totally trusts me. You know, once I come in, he's gone. He, he allows me to do what I want. He's, he's raising money. He's at luncheon. Oh, no, no, he's, he's raising money. No, he is. But he, he trusts me enough that he knows that I'm going to do my job and, 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 and he, he leaves me totally alone. He doesn't put any restrictions on me at all. So it frees me up as a choreographer to do what I want to do. Yeah. And that's a great thing. Yeah. That's a great thing. So it is like working with an ensemble theater company. Sort of, yeah. Yeah, that's the same so. kind of thing. Okay, I think I'm about done with you, but okay, I'm going to ask the cornball question. Cause I'm, uh, <laughs> ask her a question. Well, I'm going to. I'll ask both right. of you. And, and in a way, it's rather rather serious uh, I don't I can't remember if I've ever asked Bill Solo this but but Lila just you can give me the, you, let's start with Lila this idea of because I you know I'm a musician till I die whether I make any money or not at it you know what I'm saying this thing that brings us to the arts for a lifetime do, does Lila Drake remember some kind of moment something that said up oh, this is it forever um well when I started dancing it was when I was about three and my sister and I had gone to a dance show with my mom, and we both said we want to do that. <laughs> and then, and we weren't like shoved into ballet; we both chose it. But um, I think it's after I graduated and I came to State Street Ballet, and probably working with Bill was really one of those good answer. <laughs> yes, yeah, really. <laughs> one of those moments that has changed my life and really made me the person that I am. Um, I've been encouraged to be myself and to find my own signature style, um, to be an artist and not just go through the motions, things with substance. Like I, I find the details and the meaning of what I'm doing to be what's most important to me. That I'm not just doing steps or making shapes, it's that there's something behind that and that is what art is for me. And I think that that's how people can relate to shows like this. It's that it's something relatable and accessible t to the audience that, you know, it's, they can relate to the character and I think that that, we have to be humans in what we're doing and it's not just doing tricks that are, you know, kind of out of this world, which are awesome, but I think that there's the humanity and the humility and the vulnerability of being totally open on stage that I found at State Street Ballet and working with Bill that made everything kind of click like that is the stuff that I enjoy doing the most. And sorry. in terms of Bill, I mean, there's the theater, the dance thing. What was there? A, what, what came first? How'd that work? Uh, well, theater actually came first. I, 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 social dance, as I told you before in other interviews, from very early on, my parents sent me to ballroom when I was, you know, 10 years old. So me too. Uh, I hated it. Yeah, you know, junior sociables and the girls with the gloves and the whole thing. Um, and my sister was a dancer, so I was around dance. Um, um, but... Um, 
I started in the theater very young, and then I got into dance theater. Um, but um, you can see. You can see why Lila has been in the leads of many of my works, but because not everybody can also uh, uh, work the way I do, because I approach it very internally. You know, obviously they have to have the technique. Obviously, you know, they have to know how to do the steps and pick up steps and whatever. But true dancing, like acting, is you don't see the acting. You don't shouldn't see the steps. It should be come out from the inside, so it looks like it's happening at the moment. Um, that's really important, and. Um, and that's why I love working with these dancers because they really, they really appreciate a, maybe a little bit different way of working and having that realism and allowing them to be characters on stage. But you know, it's the, it also it is the ballets that I choose to do. I like to tell stories, so people are people. They're not just you know we're not doing a, you know serenade or or, or yeah, yeah. You know, a chair, yeah. dance for dance sake yeah, so much, absolutely. which tells stories too. But I really do like to tell a real story. So okay. without it, without quite answering my question, I believe something about that you decided to move from theater. I, at actually, point. Very, I'll tell you uh, one moment. Sorry, you got off. See, I get you have to you have to put me in line, Dan. Okay. You know? I will. We're going to stop in about three minutes. Go ahead. I was I was uh, <laughs> uh, uh, ten years old, and my oh, mother sorry. brought me down from Massachusetts to Radio City Music Hall, and Richard Burton and Julie Andrews were doing uh, Camelot. Ah. Uh. And I'm 10 years old. I'd never been to the theater really before. I didn't know. I, I, I mean, I, I grew up in a theological seminary. Okay, I didn't hadn't, hadn't uh, Episcopal, so uh, oh. I hadn't seen. Uh, Sorry, <laughs> it's all right. Uh, I hadn't really seen that much opera theater that much. And I remember the procession um, with soldiers walking with flags and with um, Richard Burton and Julie Andrews walking like that. And I saw the wind. And I saw the the dancers running, and I, I, I was so taken with that that from then on, theater was the stage. That whole thing became a passion of mine. And ironically, then we're going to end it, but just so I can get into this conversation. Now that you mention it, the first real event, all you know, you have the stuff with the old seventy eights when you were a kid that your mom had all that stuff. In terms of my pursuit of classical music. But the first live performance was the Spokane Youth Symphony when I was about 10, and they did a ballet program, now that you mention it. So how come I didn't become a dancer? I might have been more successful. You still okay. can, Dan. Yes, no, too late. There's still time. Give a part, oh, good. Give a part for you. Can well, you? I'm not so sure. I'd have to lose a lot of weight. Okay, now, enough of the silliness. We're going to run this through one, one very quick time. Thank you both very, very much. Lila Drake. Look at that smile. <laughs> Who plays Carmen? You'd never know. Well, you, you'll be, you, you know, she'll do her Carmen thing uh, come Carmen time. She uh, is really good. I'll and bet. Well, she, yeah. I mean, she it's is. been seven years since she's done this role. Wonderful. And she has, as an artist, has grown. Yeah. As you know. That also is fabulous, isn't it, to watch? Oh. Yeah. It's from working with Bill. Yeah, yeah. And, Wh otherwise. and William, <laughs> so William Solo, choreographer. This is a production of full-length ballet, Carmen, coming up Saturday, April 5th at 7.30 in the evening at the Granada Theater. I almost said Granada Palace uh, in downtown Santa Barbara. Phone number to call, area code 805-899-2222. Boy, you both look good. Uh, thanks. Well, she looks good. You're just being nice to me. Too much lighting. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, thanks much. Once, once again, a big hoot. Yeah. Many, many thanks. Thanks, Dan. See ya.